<laughs> Hello, welcome back. I'm joined by the one and only national treasure in the making, Laura Pidcock MP. How are you doing? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm excellent. Good. Um, we haven't got long, mm -hmm. so I'm going to have to get into the sort of the juicy part of the interview that everybody... No niceties whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, you don't know me, but no, that's what I'm like, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, you are perhaps most well known, at least to the wider public, for comments you made not long after becoming an MP, mm. where you said you weren't really interested in becoming friends with any Tory MPs. Yeah. Is that true? Have you found any sort of outliers, any of the nice people you get on with? Or? Well, I'm glad you got it right. You said Tory MPs, because actually there's been so much kind of diversion from what I actually said in, in, in the beginning. I said that I wasn't really up for going for drinks with Tory MPs. At the end of the day, that is my place of work. Um, of course, there are many, many, many conservative voters in my constituency and I want to win every one of them. I want to be credible to every single one of those people. But the idea that, um, that those people who vote conservative are as culpable as the people in government who are conservative or Tory MPs who are making some crushing decisions about my community that I then just go, all right, then I've literally expended so much energy being so frustrated in that chamber hearing Tory MP saying some of the most scandalous things about my community, but you fancy going for a pint? I just think it's like the weirdest concept ever. I think I'm being the professional one. No, no, it's good. it sounds dangerously close to professionalism, which, mm. I mean, you couldn't say that about many members mm. of parliament, could you? Well, is, that, is that the attitude? Are they just not treating it as a job? I don't know, right? I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna tell lies about that place. Most MPs, right, do work exceptionally hard, but I think there's been this dangerous narrative. Lots of the stuff you don't see as well, so, like, you spend hours... I've got a select committee tomorrow. You spend hours preparing for that so that you're, you're on point, you know what you're talking about. People don't see that. That's not on the telly. But we have been primed for more than a generation to see like consensus politics as like the way forward. And I think that's why my comments were kind of, oh, there was shock about them that I would say, actually, no, there are clear ideological divisions between me and the Conservatives. And like, I'm away from home five days a week, four days a week, and I, I've got friends at home. <laughs> I'm not going to try and make these relations with people who I do think are creating very damaging um a very damaging atmosphere in my community. Having said that, I have done lots of cross-party working because that's a very different thing. I've got an early day motion about upskirting and making sure there's legislation to protect women from having that done to them. Hopefully the Tories will sign that. That is very different from like cosy drinks on the terrace after work. Why didn't the media respond in the way that they did to your comments? Because it was outraged. I mean, even Theresa May oh, no. had to kind of, had to mention it. Why did it garner that kind of response? I think it's a bit pathetic. I think it's false outrage, or at least it's not outrage at what I really said, but some of the underlying presumptions within what I said. And I don't want to be too highfalutin about this, but... But do I, you think that's it? That the, um, what, you, what you said actually attacks the very core of Westminster policy. If you have somebody, and there are many, you know, um, on my side that do this regularly, calling out basically a bit of a cosy network yeah. that there has been in the past and um, we can come together we can work on this i'm sorry if somebody thinks that the private sector should be involved in the national health service or if somebody thinks it's appropriate to roll out universal credit in my constituency on the 13th of december some people won't get the first payments till the 28th of january I, I, how can I work with that kind of person other than a plea and say you're the people in power, stop this but there are ide the, the ideology underpins that action doesn't it mm. um, and so I, I also think there is something else as well right because yes you get a lot of um, negative comments, people saying I'm a Tory voter in your constituency I don't feel like I'm represented now and I spend a lot of time talking to those people, explaining myself and I think that's quite right because I'm a servant of all the people, not just the Labour vote as. But what about those people, right, that haven't got a penny in their bank, that have got to go to the food bank but might get rejected because they've already been twice or three times, who know that this system is coming so things are already hard and these are people who might have been made redundant because they've been out of work or whatever and then they see me cozying up to people that have inflicted that upon themselves. Who, who represents them? Ha will they trust me? Because I tell you what happened, right? In that last general election, people didn't say they're all the same. And I'm happy if people disagree with Jeremy Corbyn or think that, you know, we're really ideologically driven or whatever, as long as they're not saying they're all the same, mm. because then people know there's, there's, there's people representing them. The you said primed. 
So mm. the presumption previous to the last general election, at least, was that to be successful, you had to reach out, that had to be consensus. Mm. It was about the centre ground. Mm. You and I, people that agree yeah. with our politics before the election, said actually that's not the terrain no. anymore. And I think more and more people are now getting that. How do you think the public thinks about these things? Does it, does it look at the comments you made and think, oh, I don't like that, I want them to get along, or do they want a clear choice? What do you think is a, not necessarily even the right thing to do, but the path to winning? What's the best mm. way to proceed? I think people need to know that you are representing those communities. So um, I, I think the whole narrative around centre ground and um, almost post ideology yeah. is an ideology in itself. It's it's, ve so, it's, it's so somebody very in your party. If they say I'm a centrist, mm. what does that what does that mean to you when you hear them say it? Well, I would say um, the general election that's just being taught us that's not what the nation wants or needs right now. So you can have that, and of course the Labour Party is a broad church, but that's not what that's not what the that's not what the people want right now. So you have to respect that. Like nearly 13 million people voted for socialism, and I tell you what, I think change is incremental. So you have to kind of test. Um, what people will think about things and for 13 million people to say actually we've got faith in that I think will give confidence to m millions more people mm. to say actually I think I'll vote for that kind of change as well. You recently said that the uh, you asked if the, the rollout of uh, universal credit was a matter of gross incompetence or calculated cruelty. Mm. What does it look like to you? Do you think that the Tories are being cruel in a calculated fashion with the universal credit? It's both. Without a doubt, it's both. And I tell you why, in that chamber the other day for the debate on universal credit, the minister was like pulling his, who was responding, was like pulling his face to one of my colleagues. So my colleagues had said, universal credit is about to be rolled out in my constituency, but then talked about some people who were already on universal credit. The minister didn't even know that there was um, a first phase called live service where uncomplicated claimants would go on to universal credit first. So I was having to tell him from across the chamber, this is the minister responding, he was saying, well, how would you know if universal credit is a disaster if it's being rolled out today? I was having to say, it's the live service. So I'm a backbencher, this is the minister responding. So um, that that is shambolic as far as I'm concerned. You should know that policy inside out and all of the consequences and unintended con consequences. The reason I think it's callous is because um, if you have all of the advice and support agencies telling you it's inappropriate to roll it out in its current form, yet you still do it. So this isn't about you know ideology and the Labour Party. These are professionals working with uh, people on the ground saying, you can't roll this out safely um, in its current form and you do that anyway because you know, you're know you a weak government and it might be like, oh, another shame, shambles, because you're scared of the, the, um, the I suppose, the, the fallout from that, then that's callous, it's cruel. So you said that you were in Parliament um, as a professional, as somebody engaged in public service mm. and you, you take seriously all constituents regardless of who they vote for because of that ethic of, course, of public service. Yeah, yeah. But it can't be right then to say that a party of government is cruel mm. and incompetent and doesn't even know the policies mm. that it's advocating. I mean, that doesn't sound like public service to me. So is this mm. Tory government, is it driven by public service? I, I think ideology underpins a lot, a lot of why many people are there. So I genuinely do think um, there are many Conservative members who are working hard, by the way. I'm not saying that they're lazing about or whatever. But they are. They, they have really skewed ideas of poverty. So I think that lots of them think that people being poor is their own fault. I genuinely think that some Conservative members think that if I'd had their life, I would have chose better or differently and don't understand the crushing um, set, what like the oppressive nature of poverty what it does to your self-esteem what having little to no money in your bank account does for your freedoms for example so it would be hard to conceive why universal credit would be a crushing system if you have not got that right. conscience consciousness um, so they think you know Honestly, when you're talking about hunger statistics or poverty statistics or inequality levels, they're literally like screwing their face up as in like, what are you talking about? Because they're not seeing it. So public servants, but public servants that see very different communities than many of the Labour MPs represent. You were not a, a parliamentarian this time last year. Mm -hmm. You were looking up to Christmas. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know there was a general election until I think, what, 16th of April? Mm. Um, how much has changed in the last year? And what were you doing 12 months ago? Because <laughs> you're an outstanding politician. 
Uh, but I mean, nobody really knew much about you until yeah. you were selected. Well, I was still ranting on and stuff like that, but, um, but just like to my friends uh, and, and to my constituency Labour Party, uh, I feel like I've aged about 100 years in five months, but that's fine. I think it's just like quite a demand and lifestyle. Um, I have to caveat it at that point saying like it's not the hardest job in the world. Like there are much harder jobs um, out there that are paid a lot less. Um, so I'm definitely not c complaining, but I just had more of a private life. That, that's all like you, 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 you're accessible all the time as a member of parliament and that takes a bit of getting used to so I'd probably be looking forward to like a Friday night drink like helping sort out the Christmas work party and um, I was at a charity this time last year um, looking at racist ideas and attitudes how they're cultivated in society and what purpose racism has in society and and having beautiful conversations with young people trying to unpick those racist ideas and attitudes so much more kind of immediate gratification out of that job i remember this time last year into december january yeah. a lot of people that were backing jeremy corbyn or would were definitely going to be voting labor for them, it felt like a real low point. Mm. Um, I was one of the very few people that I knew that said, look, we can get a hung parliament. I never said anything otherwise. What did you think that the, the real possibilities of success under Jeremy Corbyn in the next general election looked like before mm. the general election? Did you, were you a true believer even before you became an MP? Yeah. Like, were you an optimist? Yeah, because you just... I, th I, I remember, right, I, I'm not going to, you know lie and say I didn't have my low points. Yeah. I mean, I never, ever doubted that socialism can be attractive to working class communities if you are not highfalutin about it. And if you talk to people's needs, if you talk about what people actually are experiencing at the minute, I had me low points. With, with, I mean, we all did, right? Of course, yeah, yeah of, course. of course, because there's only so many times you can have the door shut on your face saying that your leader's an IRA sympathiser or you're not economically credible, um, but nobody's questioning the millions in offshore trusts or bailing out of the banks or nobody's questioning that status quo. Um, th th there was a definite turning point during the gem general election, which was the, the manifesto. Um, but I definitely thought and still do think that um, what the Labour Party now and its current guise is offering is, is really different, isn't it? Like, we were brought up in, in the Blair years. I'm putting you in the same age um, bracket. Yeah, as actually, me. a bit older. <laughs> 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 we were brought up in the, the Blair years and, like, th what that does to your consciousness, it gives you a very low class confidence, doesn't it? It gives you... Um, it gives you this idea that, um, you know, this idea of social mobility and cheap credit and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It gives you a false sense of what you can achieve in society within this system. I think that's burst now. It's burst now for our generation and there's, a, there's got to be a way out. But a difference between someone like yourself and somebody like me is that you came from a historically, you know, a yeah. bastion of the Labour movement yeah. and of the Labour Party. And I was from the South. Right. Um, and I remember that experience because I went to a grammar school and mm -hmm. I remember my mum having a panic attack about Tony Blair winning. Because you're like, Labour are going to shut down all the grammar schools. <laughs> Typical Southerner. Yeah. Um, but for me, coming from that background, there wasn't that living, embodied tradition of socialism. Mm. So I understood the ideas, I understood some of the history. But for me, the real turning point was the, the financial crisis, 2007, right. 2008. Yeah. And then, like you say, I thought, right, bloody hell, this mm. is up for grabs now. Mm. The mask can come off. Gordon Brown can adopt some really social democratic policies and mm. we can... Stop pretending this thing helps people yeah. live better lives. Mm. That didn't happen. What was, the, what was the fundamental turning point for your politics? Or have you always been somebody that believed in socialism and its potential attractive qualities to the, to the mass of the general public? I don't know, because I, 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 I do remember the, the night that Tony Blair took us into office. And I remember my mum and dad crying, like, with elation. Um, they didn't vote for Tony Blair, but they were just so relieved mm. that there might be a system that listened, mm. at least. Um, so that, like, had a quite a... It was quite moving, like, the relief away from Thatcherism, away from John Major, um, and what... Because what it did to our communities was profound, and the community that I represent now has got scars that are still deep from that era. Um, and then the Labour Party came along and... and 
and it, it, it managed things. And I'm not saying there weren't loads of unbelievable things that happened because of a Labour government, um, but there were also a lot of damaging things as well, weren't there? Um, so it was about managing a system rather than transforming a system so that poverty isn't enduring. Um, that you can kind of take somebody out of poverty for a little bit, but like to make sure that workers and unemployed workers actually have control over the paying conditions, you have to allow more trade union freedoms and rights. Do you know what I mean? And that didn't happen, and that was a disappointment. And and I think, um, you know, our international, fo you know, our foreign pol policy was very problematic for my family. I have massive respect, right, for people that come to socialism on their own because I, I, I didn't. I've been socialised through a socialist lens, if you like. I've been taught since I was young. I ha you know, I remember me mum, I once, like, looked at this woman. I was like, oh, my goodness, what is she wearing? Because um, it was freezing and she had a shirt on, a skirt on, sorry, and she stopped the car and she was like, how dare you? She was like, that might be all she's got. So, you know, just little experiences. Sounds like, like a legend. I know, she, I know. She was like, how dare you? You do not comment, number one, on another p woman's body. Uh, number two, like, this is, that might be all she's got, you know, so... You know, there was questioning all along. I know other people that have been brought up in, you know, um, very kind of well-to-do families that have come to socialism on their own. They've questioned the system themselves. So I have big respect for that, especially when our education system doesn't give us our working class history. It doesn't tell us what our class achieved um, through their demands. Um, you know, it kind of it kind of teaches us that the establishment gave us everything mm. that we've got. And that's just so not true, is it? And it's certainly not true now. So, like, I have big respect for all the anti-austerity movements that have created any kind of change within this quite oppressive system. Um, because, yeah, like, the, the, the trade union and those movement, movements have shaped my politics as well and had, like, a massive impact. Final question. Yeah. Obviously, Jeremy Corbyn's going to get to stand down in street. Obvs. We're going to have a Labour government. <laughs> what are the big lessons that can be learned from the previous Labour government, New Labour? What were its big failures and how can they not be repeated? I think, and I see it in this government, that you can't have this Orwellian double speak. You can't be saying things are getting better when things are getting worse. You can't sow false illusions. Like You have to be honest with people. And I think the biggest thing that I would love, because obviously I'm not in control of the Labour Party, I'm like a worker within it, if you know what I mean, <clears throat> is to um, be really honest with people that to truly transform a system takes more than a year. It takes more than a term. That you've got to give us time to um, change the moral compass of this nation. And that is from the grassroots up and from the bottom down. And that's not, uh, you know, it's not one or the other. Um, that it will take all of the movements together alongside a you know, socialist-led government um, to create that change. But patience, because what I never want to do is like lie to my constituents and say, oh, things are going to get much better and it's going to happen in five minutes. It's not. It's going to take us time. Our investment programme takes time. Attracting industry, creating the infrastructure. Um, there are quick wins, like mm. a pay rise, mm. you know, that will alleviate people and that will give people a bit more freedom and take off the pressure. Of course, there are quick wins, but to like truly change the moral compass and like the, the fabric of this nation, it will take a while. So don't put, I, I don't want anyone to promise things that aren't going to come to fruition. On that note, we'll leave it there. A multiple term Labour government. How many terms? <laughs> yeah. Three, four? Oh, forever. Forever. One bar. <laughs> I won't say it. You've been wonderful. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, this is The Fix. We'll be back uh, next Monday. My name is Aaron Bastani. Laura, thank you again. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you same time, same place next week. Bye. <laughs>